Développé, le podcast qui poursuit les idées arrêtées. Ce programme vous est présenté par Olivier Jacquemont, docteur en philosophie politique. Bonjour Jim. So, Bonjour. Uh, uh, good afternoon and thanks for accepting our offer to come for this podcast. So uh, I would first uh, present a bit of your professional background and education background mm -hmm. and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. So you did a Bachelor of Science in Physics, Mathematics and Astronomy, then a Master of Science in Physics and finally an MBA. Yes, yes. Uh, you own 17 patents, of which four are pending, and most of them in the technology area. Yes, I was related to sensors and controls. Yeah. And you have over 60 scientific publications and conferences. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I can add to that. I think it's always, to me, important when you do technology to sort of give back. And many of us, when we got our degrees, We used other people's papers yeah. to, to further our own education. True. So I always felt it was important, although the companies a little bit frowned on us, you know, giving out too much information. So every paper is a little bit of a negotiation yes. of how much can you disclose and still offer something valuable. Mm -hmm. And then with the constraint of journal publishing, you went on to writing books, which is different. So you wrote Yeah, I'm in my books. next career after 40 <laughs> years working in uh, what I call corporate America, developing uh, whole goods. Now I'm in the virtual world of yes. developing arts and uh, yes. literature. And so after those books, you even went on to making six full, uh, uh, full length movies. And uh, most of them are released and few are still to be released. That's right, yeah. yes. In fact, we're here this month working to finish one movie we shot last summer in the south of France. It's a beautiful, oh, okay. beautiful film. Okay, okay, yes. okay. So we'll move on with your experience to discuss about why do companies fail at innovation? And uh, I refer to your book and on the chapter 11 and on the management of innovation where you mention about Clay Christensen book of disruptive Uh, innovation, a uh, pioneer uh, in innovation uh, description. And he said that why is it that established companies invest aggressively and successfully in the technology necessary to retain their current customers, but then fail to make the technological investments that customers of the future will demand? And from here, I would like to ask you uh, the first question is, why is innovation and new product development so important for companies? Yeah, I, it, to me, it builds excitement. It creates the excitement inside of a company. It comes from the new ideas, the new things. It makes you want to come to work every day. Mm -hmm. And I think a very simple explanation is, you know, if you're a businessman, there's two places you don't want a flat line. One is when you're in the hospital in an operating room. The second one is when you're in your office showing your business results. Both of those flat lines will kill you. They're mm -hmm. deadly. Mm -hmm. And, and I think this example that you mentioned in your book of the, the Nokia CEO in 2011, I guess, if you can yes. briefly describe about it. Yeah, you look at, I mean, what's interesting about the, the study of companies that fail at innovation is to study these really extreme cases. And Nokia, I also call it, was like the poster child now of disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a funny thing about uh, in December of 2010, Um, <clears throat> MIT and Harvard was planning to put out a business case announcing Nokia as one of the best managed companies in the world. Mm -hmm. I got a copy of that. Uh, but by February, of course, their business was eroding. Mm -hmm. By March, it was almost gone. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the new CEO took over and he, he gave a talk, a worldwide talk in February to every employee around the world and said basically, We're like this person that was standing on an oil platform in the North Sea, and it's on fire. And what we have to decide is whether we're going to be like him and jump into the sea and give up what we're working on and start new, or we're going to go down in flames. Mm. And to me, that was so vivid to tell people that, that we've just failed at innovation. We've failed so badly. We now have to figure out how to start over as a company. Mm. And I think this is, a, and so Nokia, a Kodak, I mean, there's many companies, I've studied now six different industries and have watched where disruption has come into them. And the way we define failure of a company is 
they typically have 80, 90% market share. Yes. And within a short amount of time, they drop to 20, 30, 10% market share. And so we call this as a failure at innovation. And this is a, a good uh, example. I think, for example, uh, we saw, so Nokia was a very old company, but for example, in the case of BlackBerry, Yes. If, if you have any anecdote about it, you know, they, in, within 10 years, they, they rose and they, they, they disappeared. Yes. So again, the, the disruption came that people were looking, you know, Nokia was so close to its customers. I mean, one thing that way companies fail is they become so successful because they become so close to their customers. So they're now listening to their customers, this voice of the customer, these practices that are taught in business schools as basic mechanisms to do innovation. They fail when you get too close to your customers because your customer is never going to ask for something that they can't envision. Mm. You have to show exactly. this to them. Yes. It's, your, it's your job as a company to bring the next ideas yes. to them. Yes. So smartphones, the idea of having apps, I mean, Nokia, I talked with people at Nokia. They had thought of this. Their operating system, the Symbian operating system, was capable of running as a smartphone, but they refused the R&D group, uh, the management refused to say that anybody would care about this. Mm. But Apple comes along, and yeah. that's the only thing they're thinking yes, about. I, yes. I mean, I'm, I build computers, so yes. I'm going to build a computer as a phone. Yes, 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 so, yes. So it changes the whole mentality. And the company, Nokia, I think was so interesting that they had this capability, mm -hmm. but they just couldn't figure out how to bring it to market. So, mm -hmm. you know, innovation involves two steps. It's this inventing, and it's this commercialization. Yes. And many companies in the R&D centers can do the inventing, yes. but they really struggle to figure out how to do the market feasibility. Yes. How do I find a market for this? Because yes. I keep talking to my same customers, yes. and my customers don't help me. And, 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 and this is good for the audience to understand that invention is just creativity, but innovation is the combination of this yes. invention yes. plus the marketing and the sale of it. That's right. Yeah, I call it technical feasibility and market feasibility. Okay. In the world I worked in, we kept those things separate. Mm -hmm. We'd work on technical feasibility, then we'd work on market feasibility. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that got me into management, uh, especially advising and lecturing as an adjunct at the business schools in, across the United States, was I uh, did a study in our own research center, our own sensors group. We had 34 products mm. that we had we had tested in the in the marketplace mm. at at uh, paper mills, at control places, at uh, on airplanes, mm. and they were sitting on the shelf. Mm. And so that dawned on me: Why are these ideas that have been proven in the that they work? Why are they still sitting on the shelf and not being sold as products? Mm. Mm. So this they all needed this market feasibility. Yes. And I learned this market feasibility takes more effort than the technical feasibility. Yes. So uh, for, I, I think it's, it's a good basis to go to the next one because we talked about, you know, uh, that failure is also from a very high level of market to a very low level of market. And disruption is also something similar. So my next question would be, uh, uh, what is that, uh, you know, disruptive innovation? Why are all companies running behind this growl for their new product development. You mean afraid of it? Or yeah, I mean, yes. they are running, for getting a disruptive product or doing disruptive innovation for companies is something everybody would like to have yes. and, and hold for a very I think long time. At, when I was at John Deere, um, they asked me to open up a research center at the University of Illinois. It's the first center they had outside of the gates of their, all their factories. Mm -hmm. And their purpose was they knew that that industry, the agriculture industry, was going to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. It's going to be disrupted. And they wanted to prepare some way to do this. Okay. So they had to go outside to try to find a research center and see if you can bring in other ideas. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think the CEOs all know this. And they're so afraid of how can they help their company uh, avoid this or prepare for it. And it's, it's mysterious. You don't know when it's coming. You don't know how it's coming. You can see these case studies, but there isn't a model that says, okay, this is happening. And, and Chris Tension often mentioned that large companies are unable to do disruptive innovation for, as you mentioned earlier, their existing customer well, base. Often the incumbents do I it. think the, the, the story is this, that what made you successful is processes. Mm -hmm. And the processes, as you get bigger and bigger, you need processes mm -hmm. to really make it and, and you fine tune your efficiencies, your profitability goes up. But it's those processes, what they do is they try to take out uncertainty. Mm -hmm. 
But you have to start with a small amount of uncertainty, like small product improvements or market extensions, where you're taking the same product but moving it to new customers. Mm -hmm. These are sort of small steps. Mm -hmm. So the uncertainty is somewhat bounded. Now your process works on this. Mm -hmm. But when you're trying to really do a new innovation, completely new to the world product, there's a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And these processes fail. They, they take you in the wrong direction when you really should be looking at uncertainty. They're trying to minimize uncertainty. So you're not looking outside the box, mm -hmm. as we say. And, and I think uh, something interesting that you mentioned uh, while we were here before our uh, uh, discussion, uh, the difference between the engineering mindset and the management mindset, which are important in innovation. And, primarily in technology innovation. Yeah. yeah, when I first was at Honeywell, it was the greatest place because I describe it as when engineers ran the company. And when engineers, you're trying to get an order, you're trying to get a revenue. I call it a revenue first process. So you're just trying to run the project. And that's what led to them losing $500 million because all these NPD projects were not returning any profit. Mm -hmm. Then when you're an MBA and you start thinking about profitability, what happens is you start to take on less and less risk. Mm -hmm. So you need this combination. And I see this center here has an engineering area and a business school. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's perfect. The world needs these two things to come together. You mm -hmm. need to find ways to do that. You just can't let one or the other run a business. Mm -hmm. They both, um, their, their motives don't drive towards innovation. They don't get you outside to mm -hmm. a completely new innovative mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, disruptive innovation, uh, as we see today, you know, we hear everybody talking about disruptive innovation. And my specific point is that all companies want to have a disruptive product uh, because they know that if they have a disruptive product, they will have an edge for a long period of time, even if long period is yes. something shrinked in today's world. But uh, do you have anything to say about it? Well, I think what I do is uh, when I opened up the research center in Kaiserslautern, Germany for John Deere, the head of the, the center came and said to me, we want to develop an iPhone. We want to be an app. We want to develop an iPhone here. So I went online and showed him, here's what uh, Steve Jobs did when he did the iPhone. You look at their profitability. He basically took all their profits for five years on his pet project which they had no product line for. They had no customers that was not serving their type of customer. So you need that type of um, capability. So wh where do you find people inside your company that can do that? Now, Steve Jobs could pull this off, but you need the same type of thing. You need to be able to take a big portion of the profitability of the company and put it on something completely different. And I think everybody wants to do this, but when you look at the risk as a manager that you have to take to do this, most managers turn and walk away. Oh, mm -hmm. no, no, we're going to do this with our tiny little budgets mm -hmm. that the management's going to give us. So just briefly, because we are reading right now a lot about ChatGPT, this is probably the most yes, disruptive yes. <laughs> thing that might have happened since Google. Do you have any views on that? Uh, I think, again, you know, this is technology and it's coming around. And so, I mean, everybody has to adapt. So this is a disruptor to, yeah. to education, yeah. yes? Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, Elon Musk says, there's no more homework. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you teach and how you educate people without uh, there's any chance to have them do homework? So, yes. uh, so I don't know. I mean, but uh, you'll win, right? The universities, yes. there's education will win. It'll find a way. Yeah, we have to. And it's a, sleep, uh, a steep uh, slope for us also in, in learning very quickly because yes. uh, in, in the next six months, we have to be ready for that students might use something like that. Yes. But the fact that it is a computer, it's also it's also recognizable, huh? Yeah. Computers are repeatable. Yes. So the, the fallacy that they will have is there will be a re repeatability there that can be found. Mm. And those, those, this can be sorted out. Okay. So we talked about how companies manage innovation and the fact that they, in any case, all invest in innovation. So... Uh, between managing innovation and investing in innovation, which one do you think is more important or both are important or how do we manage? I always both? said, you don't, you know, a lot of in, guys come with ideas, guys and girls and whatever, come to me and want, I have ideas. And I need some money. I said, no, that's the, the money will come. Get the, I, get the, the business case. Okay. Get the plan in place. Work on that. That doesn't take very much money. Estimate what your costs are. Estimate what your sales can be. Find what your niche in the marketplace will be. 
you know, it, that's a creative process. And you don't need 100 people to do this. You need three or four. Mm -hmm, Go mm -hmm. find this out. And maybe take some effort. Take some time. Mm -hmm. it's many weeks. But work on that. Then the money will come to you as once you've put a business case together. So, so, so for you, managing innovation is more in, important? Uh, and, and the biggest part is, is uncertainty. When you, when you put your project together, uh, I ran hundreds of kids, uh, students, MBA students through um, our program, and they would have to present a business case to us. Mm -hmm. And as a little uh, group of uh, academics that would listen, we could find the holes in these stories. And so you've got to figure out where those holes are and where the uncertainty is. You've got to know your own uncertainty and you have to address that uncertainty. So it's interesting. I'd like to dig this further for uh, the students of our school who are in entrepreneurship and innovation. And many of them, you know, they make business plan. OK, I'm going to get that many million of funding, et cetera. But their case of innovation or product is weak. And they all believe that in next one year, they'll get a few million years. Uh, euros or dollars of investing. So what would you tell them? Uh, Again, I think they need to look at, address where's the uncertainty. They're for, forecasting, okay, people are buying this, now they'll buy this. Or, you know, it's the switching cost to something else, or, you know, or if it's completely new need, then you have to really think, how is, how can I guarantee that there'll be some sales? How do I, how do I really convince people that I'm switching, they're switching to something different? Mm -hmm. And I think you have to address this uncertainty and you have to be honest. I always identify sort of three categories for projects. When there's uncertainty is less than 20%, okay, all the, the standard stage gate processes will work just fine. Mm -hmm. They'll, they, I call them durable processes. But when your uncertainty is greater than 80%, Mm -hmm. This is where you need to use a discovery process. Mm -hmm. And most companies don't have this process. Mm -hmm. They're bringing in Agile as a way to add some flexibility to the durable processes, mm -hmm. but they still want high quality. Mm -hmm. And they understand if I go to a d discovery type process, mm -hmm. I really cannot guarantee quality any mm -hmm. longer that comes out of my products. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's really understanding uncertainty and, and figuring out how can I explain uncertainty. Okay. And, and do you think that uh, in... in in the process of innovation, design thinking could help somewhere? Well, design is now important, huh? We mm -hmm. used to think that it was always about the money. Mm -hmm. But Steve Jobs and others have shown yes. that design has as much value yes. and is, there's much creativity in that. Mm -hmm. But it's hard, again, to put a return on investment on design. Mm -hmm. Why is this better than this? You know, mm -hmm. how, do, how do I know this? Mm -hmm. So I can just, you can, it's one of these things you know it when you see it, huh? Mm -hmm. So you have to invest in design today too. And there's some programs now that only use design and think mm -hmm. you'll have a new product at the end of it. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Apple, as you know, B-School students are very fond of Apple product. Um, they, they, they use a lot in the design thinking part on how the user would use their product uh, rather than just pure technology, you know? Yeah. So, and, and this played a, a very good role in their innovation. No, this is very good, yes. Mm -hmm. So, but does that lead to a completely new product or is that an incremental improvement? Okay. okay. You know, I have to understand that. How do I get, there's lots of good processes do that, that marketing has taught us all about incremental improvements with existing customers and, and undiscovered customers. Mm -hmm. But how do you go to the completely new product, new technology with a new customer? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, for companies, uh, is incremental innovation enough or they really have to? Well, I always said uh, a portfolio of a company should be 80% of your R&D should be on incremental. Okay. I mean, stay with what you're doing, hang in there. That's what pays everything that keeps it going. Mm -hmm. But you've got to figure out how to support 20% of your R&D in this innovative, completely new to the okay. world type thing. Okay. Now, how do you manage that? How do you select those projects? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an interesting thing for management to decide how do I put that money in that and what do I expect? When we opened up the research center in John Deere in the United States, the head boss there, I told him my experience is when you do a uh, a uh, hundred projects, mm -hmm. three will be commercially successful. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, two will actually return huge profits. Mm -hmm. He said, no, 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 Jim, that's not the way we're going to do our research center. We're going to do a hundred projects. A hundred are going to be successful. Okay. I said, well, then they're all going to be incremental. Yeah, okay. They're not going to be re innovative type mm -hmm. projects. Mm -hmm. But uh, isn't incremental also a requirement for financial 
success. I mean, yes. the financial well-being of a company. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the cost of innovation right. and disruptive is no, extremely I think high. If they like Apple, Jobs took all the R and D and went into a completely new product line. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. this only that one person once in a lifetime could do this, huh? Mm -hmm. So nobody's going to get that chance like that ever again. So you have to be realistic when you're inside of a big organization that uh, you, know, you need to figure out how to allow the incremental activities to go on. But it's hard for a manager to manage those two types yes. of projects. Yes. Because these are returning. True. You can give your rewards True. to them. You can give your, your payroll to them. Mm -hmm. And these people are longer term. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I've, have many stories in a book about uh, the inventing of the – one fascinating story is the invention of the bubble jet printer. Uh, this happened in uh, 1975. Indosun was dropped a soldering iron on a, a syringe of ink in his in his research. He saw that heat could squirt ink out of a nozzle, so he patented the idea. It wasn't until eight years later, or no, 12 years later, that they finally had their first product, yeah. bubble jet printer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what it took was the market, the, a new market for portable printing opened up and finally the bubble jet True. printer technology True. was a match for that. True. It provided value to True. that type of need. True. True. My last question on, on our discussion is, so finally, why do companies fail at innovation? Yeah, I think it's uh, what they, there's two things. One is they get too close to their customers. Okay. They stay too close to their customers, like Nokia. Okay. And the second thing is they don't understand how to manage uncertainty. So they want to do risky projects but they do it through their standard agile or durable stage gate processes. And in the process of doing that, those projects fail because they can't get out the uncertainty. In fact, the uncertainty is so much, you, it seems like you're never making progress. Mm -hmm. There's just more and more uncertainty mm -hmm. in these projects. Mm -hmm. And I think uncertainty, what they really don't un underestimate is the uncertainty of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. How do I, how can I understand this? Mm -hmm. And this takes intuition. Mm -hmm. I said there's, in the world, there's sort of two types of problems. There's puzzles and there's mysteries. Mm -hmm. In puzzles, you know, you can solve it by bringing a lot of data-rich methods to it. Mm -hmm. But puzzles, uh, in puzzles you can solve with data-rich methods, like the Rubik's Cube. You know, you move it enough, there's a methodology, you can solve it. Mm -hmm. But mysteries take people, like Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the people and find the right people to work with this much uncertainty. I always like the world of uh, Nobel Prize winners. Every year I look at them because these are people that have been successful living in a world of tremendous uncertainty mm -hmm. of what is they're trying to solve and how they're trying to work through this. It's the epitome of, of working through a problem that has so much uncertainty, but then finding an answer, finding mm -hmm. something in there. So, so in this whole process, you mentioned about uncertainty, but you also mentioned something new, which is intuition. How can we teach that? Yes, yes. I, this is a, I, I gave a paper one time in Washington, D.C. On, okay. on how do you teach uh, entrepreneurship and how do you treat, uh, teach innovation. And the room was filled with people, completely filled. And I found out 80% of them came to, to argue with me that you can't teach this. Intuition. I, yes, that, intuition, okay. yes. And I showed a way that we can teach in, in, intuition. Okay. So, but, you know, is it... Can everybody learn it? It's like okay. trying to teach the violin, huh? Okay. Can everyone learn the violin? Okay. But there's some people, in fact, my last advice to people is, is you have to find your intuition. You have to find your creativity. It's the okay. only thing left. Mm -hmm. uh, the, with quantum computing and artificial intelligence and augmented reality, jobs are going to change so much that the concepts of incremental, incremental things are going to be done by those controls, those systems. Okay. So you need to find your intuition and your creativity and build them together and put them into your resumes today. Just without going too deep into but could we find this in our own previous life, in our experiences of life? Well, you know, it's been shown when uh, people are five, six years old, 99% of people are creative. Mm -hmm. But by the time they're 30, it's less than 3% mm -hmm. of people have any feeling that they're creative. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's somehow taken out of us. Something takes it out of Something us. Something takes it. But we can, we have it in us. It's all, everyone has it. Mm -hmm. They need to find it again. And I think through good schools like this, they can encourage this. They get mm -hmm. this thinking a little bit more going. Okay. So, If, um, from our discussion, if you had two or three keywords that the audience can remember around innovation, uh, 
uh, or why companies fail at innovation. So what would those be? One of them you mentioned very frequently was uncertainty. Yes. You said also that uh, companies are too close to their customers. So uncertainty is one. What else keyword would you mention? Again, this creativity is how okay. do you, or intuition, how do you envision something outside of what's ha what you see every day? How can you, and all of us can do this. How do we? Do, how do you find yourself? I mean, it's there's not a plan that can be do this. It's, it's an encouragement. I one time I ask almost every time I go to a lecture, I ask people how many people have invented something. No hands go up. Mm -hmm. But then I start asking them more and more questions about Did you think of this? Did you think of then the hands keep coming up and up and up? You know mm -hmm. that they do. People do think about problems. Mm -hmm. They do think about how can I solve these problems. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of thinking of uh, mm -hmm. how you can mm -hmm. enhance your creativity. So. Uh, if I, 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 I conclude our discussion, so companies often fail at innovation is because they are unable to manage uncertainty well, uh, they are not able to manage their creativity well, and they are often too stuck, especially for the large one, too close to their customers to think long term. Yes. Would that yes. be a, a good conclusion? Wonderful. For this? Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you, Jim, for okay. this very enlightening discussion <laughs> with your very long experience and very wide experience yes. around innovation. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. okay. I hope to see you again. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Développer le podcast des humanités vous a été présenté par l'ESCE, la grande école du commerce extérieur et le groupe Omnes Education.